I will dance before the king of my heart Not a shame to pain He was never rushing of me Almighty God, the God of all flesh, the King of glory, I honor and I worship your name today. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to sit at your feet and learn. I worship you, O God, for bringing us to almost the end of another day. I praise your name for those of us who've had to go out and come back in and you have kept them. Father, Lord, may your name be glorified in the name of Jesus. Lord, I commit all that we will do this evening into your hands. I ask, O oh God, that by your Holy Spirit we will be able to hear what your Spirit will say to us today. Let your Spirit be on hand to teach us and let all the glory, all the honor and all the adoration come to you. We honor and we give you all the praise, O oh God. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen and amen. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to, um, to the study of the book of Joshua. We are gradually coming to the end of this study and I'm excited by the many things that we have learned. And I'm grateful to God for his love and mercy to show us from the pages of his book this many things that we have learned this evening we're going to be going to joshua 22 and that means that we have two more classes or studies to do and we are done with the book of joshua i do honestly hope that this has been a blessing to you if you've just joined us please um, share the link let our brothers and sisters come in we will begin as we normally would do with a recap of what it is that we learned at the last study. The last study we looked at um, Joshua 21 and we saw um, how the priests or the Levites were treated. We saw how they were allocated their 48 cities scattered all around the promised land or now the land of Israel and we saw that it had different um, um, that the, the way it was set up, they made sure that each, um, that the, 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 um, the, the Levites were planted right in the middle of, of the tribes so that they had access. And we talked a lot about the implication of that. We talked about the implication of the fact that um, in the, tri the tribe of Levi, that all priests, were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. And we made that distinction carefully so that you understand that um, the, the Levites were just a people called out by God and separated to himself for service and to show forth his praises in the earth. So we um, also drew parallels between the Old Testament or Old Covenant Levites and the present day Levites or body of believers. And we said that what makes a Levite a Levite is that um, he's able to shine the light of God wherever he is, whether he works as a doctor or he's a business person, or um, it really doesn't matter where he operates. He just knows enough to recognize that wherever the Lord has planted him, he is there to show forth his praise and be the light of the word, light of the word and salt of the earth. And we talked a lot about our responsibilities and as New Testament priests to the body of Christ, wherever it is, or just to the world in general, wherever it is that we're planted, do we, um, do people see the light of God in us? Or do, does it not make a difference that you are in a neighborhood, you are in an office, you run a business with someone? What is the thing that makes having you 
around different what what is it that makes it makes life different from the ones who have you around them we looked a lot at that and we talked about modeling we talked about the fact that as believers we are called to model jesus christ so wherever it is we go to establishing righteousness <coughs> excuse me establishing righteousness is our responsibility that we must embrace our place and ensure that we deliver in our responsibilities without reservation finally we agree that just as the levites couldn't own property in those days um, our call as new testament priests is not to amass wealth not that there's anything wrong with wealth but that the wealth in its true sense is to succeed in the things that god has called us to do and be a success by the definition of god's word not by the estimation or definition of man now that we're done with that review um i had a lot of fun and aha moments teaching that chapter now we're going to joshua 22 is a lot of verses but um, the message is really straightforward so our title for or our theme for this um this chapter is thy brother's keeper and we'll see what happens when people are real with each other where they can tell each other the truth and they can look out for one another which is the way God has set it up for us to run. So we had talked about um, in previous study that um, in net collaboration is the way to go. God doesn't expect us to go by ourselves. He expects us to go hand in hand with other people. And if we're going with other people, we even talked about, you know, um, raising teams at some point. If you have teammates, then this chapter is the chapter you want to pay attention to because it brings to the fore how you should do with your teammates, you know, um, in nest so that you don't just be that person who doesn't know how to work with people. I will tell you just sitting here already that I enjoy solo runs. Personally, I enjoy doing my thing by myself in my own place. But as I have grown in God and matured, I have realized that there is nothing that God has given me to do that I can do by myself. So these days, I take delight in having people join my, my team. So I have people in my team who are not even in Nigeria at all. But they are contributing their quota. And for me, that's just praise God. As long as they are able to deliver with the excellence that I can muster, then I don't mind having teammates all over the place, neither do I really mind giving credit for the work that they do. So in this chapter, what are we going to see? We are going to see a number of things. First, we'll see the need to follow directives. Again, you will say, yes. you see the need to follow directives when you are working with God. That's one thing you will see. Then you see the need to acknowledge the contributions of other people on the journey. To recognize that no one man can make the trip by himself and make a success of it. So you need other people. If you need other people, then what it means is that um, they will make, they are expected to make contributions to the success of what it is that you are doing with them. It is important that we acknowledge their responsibilities or their, or their contributions to making whatever it is God has committed into our hands a success. Another thing we'll see in this chapter is the need to understand and be understood. In the need to understand and be understood, to recognize that um, you, you can't consistently work with people and presume. Sometimes it pays to ask questions and ask the right questions so that you can continue to forge ahead on the journey that you're on with these people. One of uh, something else that you would learn on this um, from this chapter is the relevance of communication in teams. The relevance of communication in teams. But overall, the most important thing that I learned studying this chapter is the fact that God must be the priority and the focus. God must be the priority and the focus. And so, if you have a team member who isn't exactly, you are not sure is pulling their weight or is focused on God, it will not be a bad thing to call them out or to have that difficult conversation so that everyone will get back on the same page and move forward. So it talks a lot about unity. We ought to do these things together 
and to do stuff together, we ought to be on the same page. Otherwise, we will have issues. So let's go back. Let's go to our scripture and begin to read. Joshua chapter 22 from verse 1. You know I've been doing this study with the amplified version. So verse number 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and you have listened to and obeyed my voice in everything I commanded you. You have not deserted your brothers these many days to this day, but we have carefully kept the obligation of the commandments of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he has promised them. So turn now and go to your tents, to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the east side of the Jordan. Now, if you remember, in, as part of our study, we had said that before they crossed the Jordan, the, um, the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and half-tribe of Manasseh, in the days when Moses was alive, had um, demanded that Moses give them land. They had, because they were predominantly shepherds, and the land that they were on, on the east side of the Jordan, that's before they crossed the Jordan, was very lush and green. So they had appealed to Moses to say, look, give us land here because we are flock, um, we, we have a lot of herd and flocks and stuff like that who need to be fed. This is the right place for us to be. And Moses had obliged them and he had given the tribe, given the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of God, and half the tribe of Manasseh land on the east side of the Jordan. Now, when we started the study of, jo um, of Joshua, Joshua did say to them when it was time for them to move actively to take the promised land he did call them if you remember and said to them look you had promised moses that when it is time to take land on the other side of the jordan you will go with your brothers and join them to fight for their land the conquest is not complete if you don't join them so what had happened was these two tribes the tribe of god and the tribe of reuben and half the tribe of manasseh left their wives and their young ones and maybe the young men who were not ready to um, for war and went to war all their fighting men went with the other tribes to make sure that they secured land for every other tribe before they could go back to their place and rest now in chapter 22 because by chapter 21 remember that everyone now is now be settled so joshua called them and says to them look you have kept your promise to moses and you in and uh, Moses concerning what God had said when your brethren were going to go and get their land and you have listened to me and obeyed my voice in everything that I commanded you concerning helping your brother get their land you did not desert your brother you did everything that you ought to do now that your brothers have been settled it is time for you to go back home now you need to understand that this man the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh had left their families and all that they owned for at least seven years and counting in this time to make sure that their brothers had settled. And it speaks to the fact that when you are on this journey with God, sometimes you give your word, maybe by faith even, on something that you would do in, in, in the future should something happen or that thing, one thing or the other happen. When you give your word, make sure that you keep it. Because Joshua was very clear that these men honored the word that they had given. They honored the promise that they had made. And today is a day where you just file it somewhere that if I make a promise on this journey, to someone or to God himself or whatever, when that day comes, I will honor that promise. So they, all, they had honored, fulfilled everything that they said they would do. They never murmured, they never complained, which meant that they went with all of their hearts to ensure that their brothers got their own allotment of the land. The second thing I would highlight for you in um, verse number one to four is that it, what you know the thing i was talking about when we started joshua was very vocal about their contribution Vo joshua was very vocal about their contribution 
all of us need to know that it, it pays to be um, to validate or acknowledge the contributions of other people. I've run with teams. I've had people work with me for years. The one thing they can tell you if they are being truthful is that I never take credit for another person's work. I never take credit for another person's work. And I am even that, um, that straightforward that I will not hide it under the, um, the adjective we did or you know, the pronoun we did. That's not me. I will say to you, this is the, press, the point person and he got this, this done. I had in the past trained someone to do PowerPoint slides. And she became really good at them. By the time she became really good at putting up PowerPoint slides, I saw no reason to sit down and do PowerPoint slides again. I saw no reason and up to tomorrow I still no, see no reason. Whatever PowerPoint slide I'll do going forward, I would always ask her to do it. But then she transitioned off, out of employment with me. And even right now I'm planning some slides for some training that I need to do. And she'll be the one that will do them. When my friends will see, or I'll go and train for someone and they will see the slides and they will ask me, I always say to them, oh, this young lady that I mentor, she's the one that does the slides. So I've even had to um, get, um, have briefs from my friends just so that her craft, she continues to hone her craft and she continues to be really good at what she knows how to do. I have never thought about it like I trained her and while I was training her to do it, I paid her to do it. But she sat with it and she mastered it. And I have no qualms telling people that she's the one that did it. When you have someone in your team who knows how to do something, I think that sometimes it's the only way you can actually keep people giving their best. Acknowledge their contributions. Acknowledge their contributions. Acknowledge their contributions. A tree does not make a forest. That's the way we say it. Acknowledge what other people contribute to what you do. Don't just acknowledge it. Say thank you. So we saw that Joshua did that in verse number one to four. And then he said to them, now that your brothers have been settled, you can return home to your own possession and to your own tents. But before they left, verse number five to, let me see, verse five to maybe verse number nine, Verse 5 to 6. Let me read 5 to 6. It says, Only be very careful and diligently observe the commandments and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded you to, the, to love the Lord your God and walk in his ways and keep his commandments and hold fast to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, your very life. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went to their tents. And they went to their tents. Many years ago, um, it's been quite some time now, I had to go to Abuja for work. And um, I have a thing, if I'm in a, a city that is not my city, and I know people there, I would rather sleep on someone's couch than sleep in a hotel. That's my thing. I'd rather sleep on someone's couch than sleep in a hotel. If I go for, whether I travel for work or I travel for, it doesn't matter. If I'm in a, in a city that is not my city, I'd rather just perch on your couch than take a hotel. And it's not about not being able to afford a hotel. I just like the, in my mind, the safety of people's homes, people I know. So I had gone to Abuja for work. They had... Um, rented a place for me, but I also had a sister friend in Abuja. So I had called her to say, I'm coming to Abuja for work. So she arranged for her PA to come get me at the airport, take me around the city. I think I was in Abuja for two or three days. I don't remember because it's been a while. But they took me around and um, took me back. Every evening they would take me back to her house and I would eat, I would crash, and then they would take me back to... When I was done, they took me back to the airport. But during those three days that I was in Abuja, I, this, his PA, her PA had a friend, a young man by the name Charles, who came with him everywhere that I went with them. And if you know me, if you sit around me, I always take the opportunity to teach whatever I know. 
So in those three days, I kept teaching them on and off whenever we were in the car or we're sitting waiting for someone and something happened and I found the opportunity of a teaching moment, I would teach them something. At the end of those three days, it was really, I believe it was impactful for them, just as their service impacted me. So I came back to Lagos. A few weeks after I came back to Lagos, this young man, Charles, called me and said to me, because it was getting to the end of the year, I don't know whether, yes, a few weeks after, he called me and said he had been praying, and God said to him he should come to Lagos in the new year and spend one year serving me. So at the beginning of the new year in January, he packed up everything he was doing in Abuja, and he came to Lagos, and he stayed for one year. And in that one year, he was my PA, he was my driver, he was my man Friday. Anything you assigned to Charles, he would do. He was my husband's assistant. If I had to go somewhere, it didn't matter what the responsibility was. Charles would do it without grumbling. And for one year, he served his heart out. At the end of one year, it was time for him to leave. I promise you it was not the easiest goodbye for me because I had never worked at that point. I had never worked with someone who served so diligently. And all I wanted was just build a shrine around Charles and keep him. But I remember that he, when he came, he told me one year. And when the one year was up, he said God did not say he should extend. So he left. And this has been at least, I think he left in 2013. I think so. But even this morning, I spoke to Charles. As I was preparing this message, I remembered. And then I got on the phone and I called him. Charles is close to my heart. Every time that, you know, I'm in Abuja or he's in town, I expect that he will call me. Or if I'm in Abuja, it didn't matter what I was doing. It didn't matter whether he would just see me for five minutes. I'll call him and say, Charles, I'm in town. Charles had become my family. My point is, people will come into our teams on different pedestals. But if we work well together, then we can gain family for life. You understand what I'm saying? We can become family for life. And Charles served. And there was no way, there is no way the history of me and in that season of my life will be written and that young man's name will not come up. Charles served. My point is that when people when we find ourselves in a team, we need to do a number of things. Number one, we must give our all. And the reason I remember Charles this morning was I was looking at this scripture again, and I remembered, I just got reminded that he would mop my floor. If he did it in the office and I didn't have help at home, he would come home and do it. And he never complained. It didn't matter the time of the day I needed something done. I could call him and say, Charles, I need this thing done. He would show up and he would do it as long as it was, it was within his capacity to get it done. He gave his all. And that's why in that team, I would never forget him. The second thing is, whatever we start, we must finish. He came and he said, God told him one year. And he stayed through that one year. He started and he finished. And in that one year, I think he only traveled for a couple of days, maybe for a weekend or a long weekend where he had to take a car from Lagos to um, Calabar or somewhere for someone. He did not take a break for one day beyond that long weekend that he took to go and deliver a car to, I think, his uncle or something. He served, he gave his all, he started and he finished what he started. The third thing that I can attest to concerning Charles and something we can learn from Joshua and the Reubenites, the Gadad and the half tribe of Manasseh is that when we walk together, we must follow the lead of the leader. We must follow the lead of the leader. I know we're all anointed because that's a big problem we have now. Everybody is so anointed, they do not want to listen to another person. I know we're all majorly anointed. I get it, we're all anointed. But you know something, in all of this anointing that we're anointed, yes, anointing that we're anointed, there's still a leader sometimes. As a matter of fact, every time there's that one person who has the unfortunate responsibility of being the leader, 
I call it unfortunate because it's only if you're not in the lead that you think it's one cushy something. When you are in the lead, you know that the saying uneasy, wears, uh, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown, that wears the crown is real. But whether you are the leader or you are not the leader, there is a need, especially if you are not the leader, to follow the lead of the leader. Because whether you like it or not, there is order in the things that God puts together. When God puts something together, one of the hallmarks of, God, of something that is ordained by God is order. It does not make sense to be breaking the process simply because you do, want, you do not want to follow the lead of the leader. And then finally, I've said it before, but I need to say it again because I'm pulling out the points. Acknowledge what each person contributes. Acknowledge what each person contributes. Still up to tomorrow, if I go to Abuja, Charles is my go-to person to drive me around. Whenever I go there, if he has a car, I'd rather that he drove me around if he had the time. Because I feel safe. I've worked with him. I know him. Now, in verse number five and six, what uh, Joshua was saying, he, he highlighted some things that the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh did right. And you want to pay attention to these things as well, to add them to what you would do right in your nest. Number one, they heed the commandments. That is, they paid attention and they obeyed the commandments that Moses had given them. And the commandment was simple. When in verse number five, it says, be very careful and diligently observe the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, has commanded you. There was a commandment that was given. What is the commandment? Number one, love the Lord your God. There is absolutely nothing that we're able to do and do well if the love of God is not in the mix. We must allow the love of God propel us in this nest that we're talking about. Love the Lord your God. Number two, walk in all his ways. Walk in all, all his ways, not some of his ways, not the part of his ways that are convenient. Walk in all of his ways. Number three, keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. You know, we talked about parameters. We talked about boundaries. We talked about templates. We talked a lot about details and instructions. You can't excel in the nest if you are not keeping the commandments or the details of your templates, if you like. And then the other thing that Joshua, the charge that Joshua gave them, another part of it was serve the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. This is called the Shema. I will love the Lord the God, my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. And I will love my neighbor as, my, as myself. That is referred to as the Shema. It's the benediction that the children of Israel used to say. That is, this is my commitment. As I'm departing from here, this is my commitment until we gather again. I will love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my um, soul, with all my strength, with, with all my mind. I'm mixing it up now. Yeah, you get it. And I will love my neighbor as myself. The idea was if you could love of God like your very life itself, then the tendency is you would do well with him. Then finally, he said to them, even when you are loving God, remember to hold fast to him. A few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, someone sent me a message and said, I'm on a fast and I want to pray for you. How do you want me to pray for you? And I said to her, pray that God, pray to God that I will not let go of his hand. I don't need anything else. Here's the thing, the way my mind works. As long as my hand is in God's hand, everything material that I need would show up. Because I've never heard that God went hungry. So if God doesn't go hungry, if my hand is in his hand, I will not go hungry. I've never had heard that God has been put to shame. So as long as my hand is in his hand, I will not be put to shame. I've never heard that God died of, a, of, a, of, an, of a, an illness. If my hand remains in his hand, I'm confident that I will not die of an illness unless it is his time for me to come home. So all of those things, you need to look at it again. Heed the commandments. Love the Lord your God. Walk in all of his ways. Keep his commandments. That is, pay attention to his commandments. Love him. Walk in his ways. Keep the commandments that you have paid attention to. Serve him with everything that you have and hold on to him fast. 
So this week, in the course of my study, one thing that I got reminded was that we are designed for obedience. God designed man for obedience. That's why when man is walking in disobedience, you can tell it begins to affect many other things. The way man, God, man was configured by God, man was designed for obedience. Anything contrary was not meant to thrive. And that is why when someone begins to walk in disobedience, things begin to, um, what's the word, unravel at their seams. The reason why that happens is because disobedience violates our design. Disobedience violates our design. If we're created for obedience, every time we step up and we live in disobedience, we violate the very design of our being. And so you find that disobedience can throw up sickness, disobedience can throw up um, a lack of progress, and many, many, many other things. Joshua didn't forget to remind them that even though they are going back home, <coughs> the only way for them to maintain what they have received from God is that they stayed in the place of obedience. They could maintain the integrity of their identity if they obeyed. Anything short of maintaining um, of obedience, they won't be able to maintain the integrity of their identity. What does that mean? Every time you consistently live in disobedience, you begin to lose a sense of who you are. Every time you consistently live in disobedience, you begin to lose a sense of who you are. In verse 7 to 9, the armies of the two and a half tribes, it was time for them to go. It says now to the one, one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given Bashan. But to the other half, Joshua gave a, pos a possession in the west land, side of the Jordan among their brothers. So when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and he sent to them, Return to your tents with great riches and with very much livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, iron, and with very many clothes. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers, your fellow tribesmen. So the sons, descendants of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, returned home and departed from the other sons, those ones in the western tribes of Israel, at Shiloh, which is the land of Canaan, to go to the land of Gilead, to the land of their own, which they had possessed in accordance with the command of the Lord through Moses. But most, Joshua did not send them away empty-handed. I mean, they were there, they fought with them for all of this numbers of, number of years. And if you remember, after Jericho, um, they were supposed to take spoil everywhere else. So from I going on forward, they always took spoil. So when Joshua said to them it was time for them to return, Joshua did not, um, what's the word? Joshua did not... Um, Joshua did not send them away empty-handed. He made sure that the spoil was divided properly so that when they were going home, they were not going home empty-handed. Brings me to another principle of working in teams. Do your team enjoy the gains of their labor? I will not push that. Let's leave it because on Monday, we had talked about oppression, unfair wages, and all of that in the Commanding Your Money prayer meeting. So I hear that a lot of people were injured by that. I do not want to add salt to the injury. So I'll just leave that point and quickly go on. Now, it is okay to say they presumed. So after that, they left. But when they got to the region of Jordan, I'm reading from verse 10, which is the land of Canaan, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, an altar that was great to behold. And the other sons of Israel heard it. Look, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar at the edge of the land of Canaan in the region west of the Jordan on the side belonging to the sons of Israel. When the sons of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. Now, this is where it begins to get really interesting. Because these men got home and they decided to erect a huge altar. The Bible said it was a great altar. They put together a really big altar. 
they put together a big altar and news filtered back to um, the ones on the west side that look your brothers got home and the first thing they did was that they raised a massive altar and their brothers gathered together and said you know what we will go and if need be we will do well with them now that sounds extreme because in my research, I kept trying to find what did people think? You know, what were the commentaries about this particular portion of Joshua 22? And most, most of the commentaries I saw were like the, that the people on the west side were presumptuous of, people, of the people on the east side. That why would they just conclude that they built an altar to the gods, uh, the foreign gods, and decide that they were going to fight them? But... I think by the, by the understanding that the Holy Spirit gave me, that that's not quite the case. These people had been in a previous situation where they had a plague come upon them because a few people had gone contrary to God. So in this time, when they realized that, or they were told that they had put, their brothers had erected an altar, I think that they just got up and they said, we must not allow a repeat. <coughs> of what had happened before to happen again. If really they had put, to get, put up an altar, and this altar is to the foreign gods, then we need to know why. And if they will not answer us well, we will by ourselves destroy them before they destroy the entire camp. Now you say, what is the deal with that? If you go with me to Numbers, Numbers 25, I won't be able to read it, but um, it just um, is important that you see it. Numbers 25 from verse 1 to 15. You will see in my Bible it says the sin of Peor. In, the, in Peor, Peor was a land somewhere in, that the Israelites had settled on this journey at some point. And they got there and the people began to play. The Bible says they began to play prostitutes with the women of Moab. The thing about foreign gods is that they come with their daughters. So they got into this place, and before you knew what was happening, the sons of Israel were in, were in bed with the daughters of Moab. And because they were in bed with the daughters of Moab, before you knew what was happening, they were bound to Moabite gods. And the Bible in verse number 3 of Numbers 25 said, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people, who have committed sin with the Moabites and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away. And that was what they did. But before they finished doing that, guess what happened? 24,000 people died of a plague simply because their brothers were bowing to, was it, to foreign gods. Now you'll be like, that is extreme. Is God that extreme? Well, you remember that even in Joshua, when we were studying the book of Joshua, when we came to the story of, of, um, of um, Ai, why they were defeated at Ai and they lost the number of men that they lost, was because Achan stole, but Israel sinned. Do you remember? Achan stole, but Israel sinned. Achan stole, but Israel sinned. Because as long as there's sin in the camp, it can affect everybody. So I guess what the men, were, the, the, the other ten tribes were trying, to, or nine and a half tribes were trying to do when they heard that their brothers had erected an altar, was that they did not want a repeat of what had happened in Peor, where 24,000 people died. So they were like, we would rather, because that was the solution that God gave them in those days, in Moses' day when that happened. God said, everyone who was involved in that sin, the only thing that will make my anger subside or subside <coughs> is that you will bring them all out and kill them. So they gathered themselves and they said, you know what? We are going to go and confront our brothers. If this is what they are truly doing, if they are building, building altars to foreign gods, then we will by ourselves deal with them. Because if the anger of the Lord starts, we will not be able to contain, contain the anger. But then, because communication is critical when you are in a team, they decided that, you know what, let all the fighting men not go. Let's appoint for all, from amongst us, uh, us a group of men who will go. 
So the sons of Israel sent Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest. They sent a man and, and ten other leaders. And they said, go to our brothers on the, on the east side of the Jordan and ask them, what is this thing that we hear about you raising an altar? What is it about? Now you say, what's the big deal about an altar? The big deal about an altar is that Shiloh was the designated place of worship in that time. What was supposed to happen was when they were having, when they have the Feast of Tabernacles, whatever feast they have, that is where they are supposed to go. That was why when, 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 when um, yes, Hannah and Ekana and Phinehas, Phinehas his, um, his other wife, when it was time for the feast, they went up. There was a designate place where they all gathered to worship. For all those of you that are part of Winners that you don't know what Shiloh is, that you bet you attend every um, December. That's what it is about. It is a place where they all come together from all over the world to do the communion worship, communal worship, where everybody is there. It's like, let's congregate. All of our sons and daughters in foreign land, let's come together to this place called Shiloh and let's come and in one voice raise a worship to God. That was the designated place. So what that meant was if an altar was raised elsewhere, even if they decided to, lay, um, to offer sacrifices to God from that altar, it was wrong. That's number one. Not to talk, if not, not to talk of if the altar was now raised um, to a foreign god. So it was tricky. They were not being pres presumptuous, in my opinion. They were not um, trying to judge their brothers and sisters. They just didn't want a repeat of a disaster. But thank God they didn't go to them straight to fight. So they sent someone. And when he got there, in verse 15, they came to the sons of Reuben and the sons of God and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead. And they said to them, this is what the entire congregation of the Lord says. What is this disloyal and unfaithful act which you have committed against the God of Israel? So as to turn away from following the Lord this day by building yourselves an altar to rebel against the Lord this day. Is this... Is the wrongdoing do, idolatry of pure not enough for us, from which we have not cleansed ourselves to this day, even though the affliction in which 24,000 people died came on the congregation of the Lord, that you would turn away this day from following the Lord? If you rebel against the Lord today, he will be angry with the entire congregation of Israel. Remember at the beginning of this study, we said that what one man do, does can affect the rest. And so that expression is my life does not count. It does not count. You are the one, he is the one that made, that got in prison because he would never pay attention to what they are telling him. His family are the ones making the trip to the tree, prison every week to make sure he's all right. Can you see how when one hand touches oil, it, one finger touches oil rather, it can soil the entire hand. That was the conversation. They were saying, we can't let you mess up. Because if you mess up, it will come back to us. And we do not want, not at this point, when finally we have an inheritance. We are not going to let that happen. Long and short of it is that from, um, from verse 21 to 23, you will see that the tribe on the east side did not even take offense. Because when you are looking out for your brother, your brother ought to know you are looking out for them. Now, I'm not... In the least, people don't, uh, don't get it because when I'm doing this thing I'm doing, I can be really passionate. But I am the least, the, in fact, I hate confrontation with it. I am the chickenest of the chickens when it comes to confrontation. I don't like a confrontation of any type. I would rather continue to suffer in silence than to confront people. But as I'm growing older, I have seen that every time I should have spoken up in January and I ended up speaking up in July, there, there's always someone who suffers. I suffer, but sometimes there are other people who suffer in the process. So I'm actually in the process of learning to speak up. If I'm uncomfortable with something you are doing, I'm learning to speak up. And if you have ever been on the receiving end of me, Telling you that what you are doing is making me uncomfortable. I can tell you don't be angry 45 times. 
<coughs> That's because I honestly do not like confrontation. So the children of Israel could have sat down there and refused to confront their brothers, which would mean that they would have had an idea or um, an opinion about their brothers that was not correct. But thank God they are teaching us that we need to speak up. So when they got there, number one, they reiterated their commitment to God and agreed that they should not, they, they spoke to their brothers. And I like what they said to their brothers. Actually, they said to them at some point, they said, look, if the land, from verse 19 to 20, you need to read it. It says, if the land that you have gotten, <clears throat> if it is an offensive or oppressive land, just leave it and come. Come to the west side. We will give you land. We would rather make a sacrifice and make room for you than have you fall away from the faith. You see, what we do when someone is not getting it right, most of the time, and I've done it before, and I'm not proud of it because I now know better, is we wash our hands off people. But that's why our, our correction is ineffective. The best way to correct someone is not just to tell them what you're doing is wrong. It's to put ourselves out and say, if you need help in correcting what you're doing that is wrong, I am here to help you. Say, for instance, you know a couple who leave, who come to church and you found out they are living together but they are not married. The indignant response we get 80% of the time from the body of Christ is to put them out and say they are sinners and put them out. But what we ought to do is because we love them, why we hate their sin, we love them. What we ought to do is to say to them, look, this thing you're doing is wrong, number one. Number two, God cannot be happy with this. Number three, you need to separate until such a time when you are able to marry. And of course, they'll probably come back with something like, oh, we can't afford separate rents. Then that is when the rubber hits the road because you as the one correcting ought to be able to say, okay, I will contribute to rent for you just so that you can get yourself out of harm's way because sin is harmful. But what we usually do is we just cast them out. We don't want sin mentioned in our midst. So we just throw them out with nothing to help them. I've had to discipline people in the last three years at the well. And one of the things that I do is that I'm the leader. And so I must be very cut and dry about what the parameters are. But every time I've had to do that, I usually will go back and say to one of the leaders, I need you to hold this person by the hand so that you can restore the person. And I do that and they always come back to me with reports. And if I'm not seeing progress, I always go back to the middle person to say, what's happening here? When was the last time you spoke to this person? Because the idea is not for the person to fall away. The idea is to find a way to get the person to get back into their love for God. Just putting that out there. Because if we are believers and we want to do this next thing, and I'm hoping that we will do with more believers than unbelievers, you need to understand that people would make costly mistakes. So how do you correct them and not cast throw away the baby and the bathwater? What the, children of the, the, the sons of Israel did was that they said to their brothers, if the land will cause you to sin, or put yourself and come back with us. We will make room for you. They were willing to make sacrifices for their brothers to be safe. So the question that we need to answer today is, are you willing to make a sacrifice for your brothers to continue to exist and live in God? Because you see, we've done a lot of armchair Christianity and we need to move away. We need to become the Christians who put on workmen clothes. To recognize that true Christianity gets your hand dirty. It gets your hand dirty. So if someone is in the wrong, do you cast them away? Okay, I agree, we agree. He stole and that's why he's in jail. Did his wife and children steal too? If he can't provide for them in that time, what are you doing? It, whatever you can contribute, will you, continue, will you just leave them and just... 
and brand them thieves altogether. Where's the place of making room for someone to repent and come back to God? These are all the things that we need to do because we need to move away from the theory of this work and go into the nitty-gritty of the practical of this work. Otherwise, we will continue to be a powerless body that have nothing but mouth. So he spoke to them. They spoke to them and they said, look, if this is not working, then come back home. We, we will take you in. And it was a good thing because the other ones, what that did was it showed their, their brothers that, you know what, they don't hate us. They want the best for us. So guess what happened? They couldn't even take offense and say, oh, you mean you don't know us enough. They took the time to explain to their brothers. They said, no, we did not build an altar for worship. We built an altar for memorial. Because we also think that because you guys are on the other side of the Jordan and, um, and Shiloh is on the other side, we are not sure what our generations coming will think. We have to build an altar here so that our children, when they ask us, will say to them, this was where God took us from to, and our brothers to cross the Jordan. So that they will always remember that they have an affinity to those on the other side. So it turned out that the altar they built, even though it was a magnificent one, was not one that they were going to put burnt offerings on. It was an altar that they had built just so that their sons and their daughters will never forget that that was the place they crossed from to get into what the rest of the promised land is. And we need to pay attention to these things. Now, if you go through the Old Testament, one thing you will notice is that people always put up altars and memorials to, um, call, uh, to, um, in what, um, to create memorials for <clears throat> encounters that they had with God through their lives. Do you understand it? So when, what they raised the altar for was for that kind of thing. And the moment they took the time to explain to their brothers, it was all resolved. I, I have a feeling they just, they laughed over it. They drank together. They patted each other's back. And the other ones returned home. What did I learn for, from Joshua 22? A number of things. You know, because in verse 30 and 31, the tribes in the west side see reason and accept the explanation. And at the end of that chapter, it said that everyone was settled. Everyone was settled. But I see a number of things that I want to highlight. For our journey in our nest, these are critical. Some of them I've talked about before. At least one of them, I talked about obedience. Obedience. Remember, we are created and designed for obedience. Every time we walk in disobedience, we violate our design. And so, no, do not even. But beyond that is that we saw courage. The matter was resolved because somebody was courageous enough to ask the hard questions. I wouldn't, in my natural, I would not ask these questions. They scare me. They scare me even more because I do not know what the answer that, what answer the other person is going to give me. That's why it scares me to ask questions. But you see, you cannot truly forge a unity unless you ask the hard questions you ought to be able to say to someone i saw your car somewhere and i know that a married man shouldn't have his car parked there what were you doing there at that time better see park the car beside beside his own and call him and say where are you i am right beside your car i need you to come out that's how we become our brother's keeper yes he may come and yell at you and say is it your business but he would never forget that someone cared enough to wait for him and lead him back to his father. So courage is required to have difficult conversations. And because teams are made up of individuals from different backgrounds, a great dose of courage is always required. The second one is humility. Even when I'm the one that is coming to ask the questions, Lord, teach me to be humble. So that I don't sit on my high horse and judge you from start to finish in, in, in under the guise that I'm asking you questions 
or I'm trying to have a difficult conversation. And then on the other side, if I'm the one that is being asked the questions, Lord, keep me humble that I will take the time to explain to the other party and it will not look like I'm taking them for granted or have something to hide. May I not take offense? Because when you take offense like that, then what we thought it is, is what it is. The fourth thing that I saw is communication is critical. I had highlighted it when we started. You cannot continue to build together and do this life together if you are not communicating. So someone came and said, we saw them build an altar. They first of all upset, got upset and said, do they dare? We will by ourselves go into war with them. But they had another conversation that said, look, it doesn't make sense. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's ask them first. And then if we ask them and what it is that we have heard is what it is, then we can go back and fight them. But first, let's ask them. It must have been that they had that conversation and before they arrived at that conclusion to send 11 men to them um, to go and find out what it was they built the altar for. The other thing that I see in this chapter is that we need to be ready to stand for what is right. We must be ready at every point in time to start for, stand for what is right. It, will it go as smoothly as we see in chapter 22? Every time you stand for what is right? No, it would not. But will it be worth it if your motive truly is, I am watching up for my brother? So worth it. So worth it. So worth it. So, so, so worth it. When you have someone who should judge you, just sit with you and say, tell me what the problem is. I'm willing to help you find a way to solve it. We begin to see Jesus with skin on. And so this chapter highlights for us that even in the journey of this beautiful nest that we've been painting, there will come a time when it won't be as comfortable where people would look like they are misbehaving or people will actually misbehave or disbehave or unbehave, whichever word you prefer, or maybe all three of them. But when that time comes, will you see Christ in all of that, the conversations that you need to have and in all the decisions that you need to make? Because in the end, we cannot be the people who get into this space and do it the way we used to do it throwing people out of their father's house. I personally have been thrown out of my father's house before. And I know what it feels like for someone to say you are not welcome in church. I know what it feels like. I have been there before. And so because of that, we must be careful. We must have thought it through. If one of us falls tomorrow, what will our restoration process look like? What will it look like? What are we going to do about it? How are we going to help this person through what he needs to go through? Because that's what it is in the end. Years ago, we had someone who had got fallen into sin outside wedlock and um, had gotten his girlfriend, fiancé, whatever, pregnant. And he mustered all the courage in the world. I, I think he must have killed him. But he came to us and he said, this is what I have done. I've always mar wanted to marry the girl, but this is where we are. Of course, we benched him. He couldn't minister in the capacity he was ministering for a while. We benched him because he was wrong and we needed to draw that line that he was wrong. But we rallied around him. We contributed money. We did everything to make sure that they made good. Um, they got married. Because we were not going to allow the con uh, situation to continue to degenerate from that point on when he'll be running up and down to say he doesn't have money to get married. We put our heads together. We contributed money. We called other workers. We told them this is what has happened. But if any one of you repeats it, we will bench that person for longer than we are benching him. And it is instructive to know that by the time I was leaving that place. This young man and his wife, they had two children by the time I was leaving, beyond, behind, leaving that place. And they were doing well. 
Now, does that mean that we encourage that that should be the lifestyle of people? Of course not. But when one falls, what do you do? What do you do? And we need to pay attention to these things. I think that the body of Christ, um, um, Pastor Rejoiner has said it before, and I want to echo it, that the body of Christ is the only army that stabs its fallen, uh, wounded and fallen soldiers. We stab them and trample on them. Right, meanwhile, the rule of thumb is you never leave your man behind. Even if they are dead, you carry their body back home. And if they are injured, more, more than ever before, you must get them back home. But in the body of Christ, what we tend to do is, once someone is falling, we are the ones that announce it. We are the ones that trample. We are the ones that tell everyone about it. We are the ones that will come on Facebook and post it and post it and post it and post it. Thereby, giving, not giving them the opportunity to come back to their father. Because we've judged them already. We've done everything that we could do. We have just messed up their lives already. And so you find that the, these people now find it difficult to truly come back. And for me, this was um, a reminder again that this is the way we ought to do it. This is the way we ought to do it. This is the way we ought to do it. Now, they could have built the altar to a foreign god because down the line, some of them will go off and build altars where they had no business building altars. But this becomes a template to restore peace and to restore unity. And if I would open, if you open with me, I know that it's 7 p.m., but if you open with me, this wasn't in my notes, but I want to close this here. Why would we make all of this effort for people who have no regard for what God has said and because of that they've fallen into sin or they have contravened and they ought to be punished? Well, the thing is the punishing is not yours and mine to do. That's number one. But number two, beyond everything, Psalm 133. When I attended Bible college, I did my Bible college project on Psalm 133. And Psalm 133 for me is very close to my heart. It says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil of consecration poured on the head, coming down on the bed, even the bed of Aaron, coming down upon the edge of his priestly robes, consecrating the whole body. It is like the dew of Mount Hermon coming down on the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Life forevermore. Life forevermore. The body of Christ does better when we speak with one voice. Your teams will do better when you are united. As the leader, do not encourage backbiting and divisive conversations. Unity, the place of unity is where the Lord has commanded the blessing. Many, 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 over 21 years ago, this scripture was ministered to my heart. And I have known that without no doubt, if I would work with people, I would work with them in unity. And I have unfortunately worked in teams before, in the body of Christ, in leadership capacity, where there was no unity. We could do nothing. I remember we were over 100 people, we were like 120, 150 people. And we couldn't buy a 1 million naira plot of land. No, 8 million naira plot of land that we had seen. We did everything. We couldn't even raise 10% of that because there was so much divisiveness in the body. And then eventually people left and we were reduced to like maybe 35, 40 people. And 35, 40 people who were united bought a plot of land for 25 million at that time. You can never underestimate the power of unity. So even if you didn't go away with anything at all in your nest, make sure that you work well with people. Make sure that you speak with one voice because that is where the blessing is being commanded. We've just finished chapter 22 of the book of Joshua. And um, on Saturday morning at 9 a.m., we look at chapter 23, the penultimate chapter. And next week, Wednesday, it will be a wrap. It's been so much fun bringing this chapter your way. It's amazing what you can find when you truly open the pages of your Bible. Try it. You will be amazed what you will find. 
this has been very 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 interesting for me to do and enlightening as well for me to do i hope you've been blessed and you'll keep a date with me um next on, on saturday at 9 a.m when we look for we look at the next chapter of the book of joshua thank you so much for joining the broadcast if you have questions, you know you can always send me the questions. I'm hoping that, you know, I'll probably be able to collate questions and then um, come back, maybe do one final um, session of, on the book of Joshua after the teaching is done, just to answer questions people might have had through the entire book as we studied. So if you have questions, it would be nice to send them in. We'll find a way to collate them and see whether the, it's worth um, coming back to do a wrap-up session for this book, you know, by answering the questions. Thank you so much for joining the, pray, uh, for joining the broadcast this evening. I'll see you on Saturday on the study of Joshua, if Jesus tarries. God bless you and keep the light burning. Have a good night. Bye-bye.